The House Select Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection is looking into whether former President Trump used so-called burner phones during a seven-hour gap in official White House call records during the riot, during the attack on the Capitol. In response, Trump said in a statement, quote, I have no idea what a burner phone is. To the best of my knowledge, I have never even heard of, of the term. Joining us now is former Trump national security advisor, John Bolton. Uh, Sir, what do you say to that? Well, I, I can't understand what the, the former president is, uh, is saying because uh, I heard him use the term uh, burner phone a number of times. It's hardly like it's some obscure, highly classified uh, a set of words. Uh, criminal gangs in the United States use burner phones. Terrorists around the world use boner, burner phones. And as I say, I, I heard him mention it. So uh, you'll have to you'll have to guess what the reason for his statement is. He said, "quote burner phones" in in conversation. He did, yes. It, it was a term he actually kind of liked. He'd say, you know, they have these burner phones. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's uh, it, the president, former president's uh, acquaintance with the truth is often very casual. I think this is a good example of it. So did he have a burner phone? Well, I don't know. You know, he uh, he didn't come down to the Oval Office typically until late in the morning. He made calls up from the residence. Uh, I certainly spoke to him up there many times on on regular phones, on the secure phones or regular landline. Uh, what else he was doing up there, I, I certainly don't know. What do you make of this seven hour gap in the call log? Well, I think it's very hard to believe that anybody uh, redid the log to purge information from it. Th these are these are routinely made. They're not subject to high level scrutiny. So if there was interference with it. It would be quite extraordinary. I, I think it means uh, that uh, that uh, pre former president made a deliberate effort not to use Oval Office phones or or government phones during that period. I, I don't know how else to explain it, since we know from what others have said. Uh, he did have phone conversations with them that day uh, that are not uh, outside that gap period. So you think it's possible that he was purposefully not using the White House switchboard or the White House phones the way he might normally use? I, I don't know what other explanation would make any sense, frankly. W why would he do that? Well, because he didn't want a record of the calls and, and what he was saying in those calls is, uh, is anybody's guess. Some people have said they received calls. They've described what the subject of the conversation was. Uh, so, so we know he was making calls. What other calls he made at this point, uh, we don't know. Yeah, we know he made calls. He was on the phone with Kevin McCarthy. He called Senator Lee looking for Senator Tuberville. I guess he had the phone numbers messed up there. Um, I, I do want to ask you about Ukraine because it turns out that the Russian military is not so good. And U.S. intel really overestimated the ability of the Russian military. Why do you think that is? Well, I think uh, we overestimated the ability of uh, the Russian military, underestimated what the Ukrainian military forces could do. And, and I think uh, the, the Russians made s m many of the same mistakes. Now, there's this business out yesterday of uh, U.S. and U.K. officials saying that the military in Russia was misleading Putin. Uh, I don't buy that analysis. And by the way, they're not putting out information. They're putting out analysis of the information. Uh, I, I don't think there's a, a government in human history that I'm aware of where one of the top leaders' advisors was not perfectly prepared to say that another top advisor had made a complete mess of things. Uh, I, think, I think they've got the information. I think their calculations proved to be as, uh, as inaccurate as, uh, as U.S. intelligence or French intelligence or French intelligence that predicted there would be no invasion. The head of French military intelligence reported by the BBC to have been fired this morning. Some of the information about that intel that has come out as well um, is that the Russian military isn't following orders. We heard this from the UK intel chief, that the Russian military is actually sabotaging its own equipment and in at least one case shot down one of its own planes. Uh, does that surprise you? Well, I think a part of the problem here may be continued corruption in the Russian military, despite decades of effort to improve it and modernize it. 
corruption is so rampant across Russia, it's really it's a it's a it's a racketeering organization, not a government that uh, a lot of this was going on and, and top level defense officials may not have realized it. But when put to the test of actual combat, all this showed up. I, I think the, the disastrous performance of the Russian military has caused uh, such a reputational blow that uh, I think it's an added reason why Putin has no incentive, you know, from his perspective to negotiate. Uh, if his military is to have any uh, effect in terms of threatening other countries, he has to have some military victory he can point to. He certainly does not have it yet, and I, I don't know what it is uh, in prospect for him. So the bad news is I think actually this failure contributes to their determination in the Kremlin to continue this, uh, this conflict until they can achieve some success that justifies the invasion in the first place. Yeah, it, it certainly does appear that that is what's playing out. Um, Senator Mitt Romney told Casey Hunt on her new CNN Plus program that NATO countries are going to be worried about their security, right? They might consider other alliances if President Trump succeeds in winning another term as president. Uh, do you, what do you think NATO countries will do? Do you think NATO will fall apart? Well, I think I think if Trump were to get back into office, which I don't think is going to happen because I don't think, among other things, he's going to run for the nomination in 2024. Uh, I think, as I feared in a second term, if he had been reelected in 2020, that he might well withdraw from NATO. I think this would be a, a catastrophic strategic decision for the United States. Uh, but I don't think it's unreasonable for other NATO members to worry about it. It's another reason to try and put Trump in the rearview mirror. Uh, sir, really appreciate you being with us. Ambassador Bolton, thank you. Thanks for having me. Christian. New reporting this morning from the New York Times that the Justice Department is actively expanding its probe into the January 6th insurrection. The Times writes the prosecutors are looking into the organizers and prominent participants in the rally on the ellipse and potential criminality in the promotion of pro-Trump slates of electors to replace slates named by states won by Mr. Biden. That's a direct quote from the Times. We're back with Chris Wallace, host of the new CNN Plus show, Who's Talking to Chris Wallace. And Chris, you know, it's been this question among Democrats for a while. Why isn't the Justice Department looking more closely at the inner Trump circle in regards to the insurrection? And now you have this article in the Times and also the Post this morning, that maybe in some ways they are. I wonder how big of a deal you think this might be. Well, obviously, if they move against them and bring charges, it's a, a very big deal, John. The question is, I'm a little bit skeptical, too, as to whether they're going to jump. I mean, remember that in the January 6th committee, the in, investigating in the House, uh, referred uh, and, and the whole House referred contempt of Congress charges to the Justice Department back in de uh, December for Mark Meadows, the, the former chief of staff to President Trump and the Justice Department, what is that, three months since then? Uh, and they've done nothing with it. And I know a lot of members of the January 6th committee are frustrated with that. So how aggressively are, you know, it's one thing when it's the, the organizers and the people that were actually on the ground in the insurrection, but when you're talking about people inside the White House and what their role is, and they were officials, you haven't seen much movement yet by the Justice Department. I think the only person that they brought charges against on contempt of Congress was Steve Bannon, who, of course, was not at that point uh, a White House official. Really interesting moment on your new show where you were talking to Bob Iger, the former Walt Disney CEO, about the role of corporate leaders in weighing in on certain topics, including this so-called don't say gay bill in Florida. Let's uh, listen to this moment. A lot of these issues are not necessarily political. It's about right and wrong. So I happen to feel, and I tweeted a, an opinion about the don't say gay bill in Florida. To me, it wasn't politics. It was what is right and what is wrong. And that just seemed wrong. It seemed potentially harmful to kids. When you're dealing with right and wrong, or when you're dealing with something that does have a profound impact on your business, then I just think you have, you'd have to do what is right and not worry about the potential backlash to it. It is such an interesting moment because even if it is about right or wrong, it is still political. 
Well, and it's also still business, which mm -hmm. is even more important if you're the CEO of a huge company like Disney. It's interesting. We did this in most of the interviews on Who's Talking on CNN Plus are going to be live. But we did go to L.A. and tape a few interviews. This was a couple of weeks ago when there was a big furor about the don't say gay bill. Uh, and, and you saw the, the reaction from Bob Chapek, who has succeeded Iger as CEO, who at that point was saying, I'm not getting in the middle of this. You know, we're uh, a, our company and our message of unity is what we want to. And although he didn't directly contradict or criticize Chapek, it was pretty obvious that when he said sometimes it's just a matter of right and wrong, that Iger was kind of distinguishing himself from the successor and saying sometimes you don't worry about the business and you don't worry about how it's going to affect you. You just have to take a stand. So so that's interesting. And there's been so much pressure from inside the company on Chapek that he's now ended up probably a little bit too late coming out and condemning the bill. You know, Chris, we both worked for Bob Iger at one point back when we were at ABC News. You, of course, were this big time oh, anchor yeah. and correspondent. And I was a lowly desk assistant and writer for a while. And I remember how excited I was. I used to have to write news briefs, which is what anchors would read that would get dropped into the soap operas in the afternoon. And I remember how excited I was that I actually got to write a news brief for you once. And, and, and I just that's just such a happy memory. And now I get to I get to meet you here uh, and you're at CNN. So it's, it's thrilling for me. I just wanted to say welcome. Well, and that, I know you that, must remember that news brief very well. I, I, I do. It was one of the worst written I've ever <laughs> I've ever seen. And I, in fact, I probably hurt your career because I said, who wrote this thing? They said, Berman. I said, no, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. Again. I will say one thing I learned about Bob Iger. He woke up incredibly early. In fact, when I interviewed him, he's retired now. I said, what time did you wake up this morning? He said, 415. And I found this out and I found, you know, he was the head of ABC at that time. And I was uh, working with Sam Donaldson and Diane Sawyer on a show called Primetime that if you emailed him at six or seven in the morning, you'd get directly through because none of his assistants were there and you could send an email directly to him and he'd answer you back. So you should have done that, John. If you had just emailed, uh, you know, things right. would have been very different in your career. I think we also can't let I you go. I could have gotten off news brief quickly. <laughs> <laughs> we can't let you go without noting that you were an accomplished celebrity Jeopardy contestant, right? Well, uh, compared to, well, look, but John Berman has more money on his placard. Yeah, that's early in my thing. That you, you got me in single Jeopardy, not double Jeopardy. <laughs> Berman picked, I Berman ended picked up, the photos. Here's the real question. I ended up winning. John, did you win? I did. I did. Oh, good. Well, then you and I are going to have to have a celebrity Je Jeopardy face off sometime. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I want to have dinner with <laughs> the two of you. Oh, you're in it, too. We've got to have three contestants. Oh, I am not a winner. I was on a CNN quiz show and didn't even win that. So what does that tell you? I need to be schooled. That's what it tells you. Chris, it is such a pleasure having you at CNN and having you here this morning. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. And can I just say, oh, you're about to promote it, so I'm not going to... Here, you I'm promote gonna, it. You well, promote I was, it. I, you know what? I will now read the telephone. Who's talking to Chris Wallace? Two critical new developments that suggest Russia's war on Ukraine is not going according to plan. First, listen to the UK's top intelligence officer describing what's happening with Russian troops on the battlefield right now. We've seen Russian soldiers, short of weapons and morale, refusing to carry out orders, sabotaging their own equipment, and even accidentally shooting down their own aircraft. Russian forces disobeying orders, sabotaging their own equipment. In breaking moments ago, Russian President Vladimir Putin signed a decree to draft more than 134,000 Russian citizens into the military. U.S. intelligence officials say Putin is angry and feeling misled because his own military leaders failed to inform him about key failures throughout the invasion. They were apparently too frightened to tell him. Also this morning, signs that Russian forces are regrouping in Belarusian territory after suffering heavy battlefield losses in Ukraine. Negotiations with Russia are ongoing, but President Vladimir Zelensky calls the talks only words. He says Russian troops are now concentrating in the Donbass region for a new round of attacks. And there's also some new video that shows a bombed out Russian tank. This is a, a tank that is on fire in Sloboda, which is about 12 miles from Chernihiv. 
Ukrainian troops have retaken Sloboda, further blocking efforts by Russian forces to surround Chernihiv. In the meantime, Chernihiv's mayor tells CNN the attacks are increasing. He also says that people are being injured by Russian mines, including mines that are being shot into the city by artillery. I want to go live to Kyiv, the Ukrainian capital, and bring in CNN's chief international anchor, Christian Amanpour, who's there. Christian, I want your take on this news out of Russia. Uh, a new conscription, 134,000 new Russian troops. What does that tell you? Well, first of all, this would be recruits, right? So they wouldn't be professionals ready to go and do anything here in Ukraine. But it might mean that what he's trying to do is rotate and regroup if, in fact, he has more professional troops on standby somewhere in Russia. Because clearly this first phase of the military plan has not gone according to plan. And you just reported what the head of British GCHQ has said, and that, you know, low morale, sabotaging their own vehicles, in one case, shooting down their own aircraft. That doesn't apply to all of them, but enough of them um, that has made a, you know, a difference on the battlefield. And so, you know, we wait to see whether, in fact, this regroup in Belarus uh, actually means bringing much more professional, more motivated Russian troops to the battlefront. I was outside Kyiv today in, in, the, in the outskirts, and you know, the, the troops that came towards Kyiv on day one came from Belarus. And I was there with Ukrainian soldiers, many of them veterans. These are not just, you know, you know, day soldiers. These are people who fought in the Donbass, have been fighting since 2014 highly trained and armed. And we saw literally a column of armored vehicles and at least two Russian tanks that had been blown up and disabled. Now, this happened a couple of weeks ago, or rather several weeks ago, during the first uh, few days of the war. But nonetheless, they wanted to show us how they stopped the advance of this column into Kyiv. Now, what we don't know, John, and I think it's really important, we know that, that, that all that we're hearing about the stalling, about they've failed to take, you know, obviously this big capital, but we really do need to wait and see what they do with any regroup and whether they do intend to continue to come down sure. and try to encircle this capital, what they do on the east, you know, whether they intend to break the country and try to encircle Ukrainian troops elsewhere. Um, people think it's, you know, Putin's in it for the long haul. Christian, I'm really interested by your trip to the outskirts of Kyiv today. What else did you see when you were on the ground there? It's so great to have you there. Well, it was really extraordinary because we drove, it's about an hour or so out. Uh, we, the first thing we were able to see in the neighboring village was a lot of people waiting for humanitarian aid. And when we finally talked to them, you know, they told us that, they're best basically getting nothing because of all this fighting. The shops are empty. So we pushed further on to where actually the Russian advance had been stopped. And we talked um, both to the, the, the younger officer who told us that he, with his javelin, had taken out a key Russian tank that was faced and facing the city, the town, the village, and had started to wildly and indiscriminately, he said, start shooting residential areas. And we saw that evidence. We saw houses and homes, nothing, you know, in terms of a military target, shot up, all shot up. Again, this was during the first few days of the war. And he just I mean, the thing is incinerated. The, the road is just strewn with shells from the, autom you know, the, the heavy machine gun, the 30 millimeter shells all over the floor, plus there are tank shells, plus there's heavy artillery that was used, plus there was shelling from mortars. You can see uh, the rosette pattern on the main floor, on the, on the, sorry, on the main road. So there was a lot of attempt by the Russians to take that town and to keep pushing forward. And these were in the initial days when they didn't know that they were going to face resistance. And as I said, we, we counted uh, four armored vehicles. Uh, we were told there's another one that we couldn't actually see because it was in the woods, two tanks. And they told us all the troops had, had died, had been killed in this. You know, at one point they told me vaporized. So, so you know, that and they said the local villagers had, had buried some of the bodies. We saw trenches being dug. Uh, they said to us, we're not just defensive right now. We're planning to go on offensive if we have to, to push them back. They said they had enough ammo at the moment. They had certainly high morale, high training. And yet I asked them, you know, this is a army that is much more heavily, you know, armed than you are. It's much more powerful than you are. But they were convinced that they can continue to hold out. That's what we saw. 
What a remarkable view. And I have to say, it is so unusual to see the amount of burnt out military equipment that we keep seeing all over this country. It really is remarkable. Christian Amapur in Kiev, great to have you there. Thank you. Want to bring in the Senate Democratic Whip, Dip Durbin of, Dip Durbin of Illinois, the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, he did receive a classified briefing on the situation in Ukraine. Senator, thank you so much for being with us. What did you learn? What have you learned about well, the situation important, here in this country? I had two important meetings uh, yesterday. The first, uh, as chair of co-chair of the Ukrainian caucus, about a dozen senators, both parties, met with six Ukrainian parliamentarians, and they told us their impression of the, what's happening on the ground. One of them, uh, a woman, uh, her husband is in the fight, and she's in touch with him by telephone. So it's pretty timely information and certainly very credible. And then we followed it with an intel briefing. Uh, I think there were over 90 senators in the room. That's amazing around here when you can draw 90 people. It shows the level of interest and commitment by the United States to the people of Ukraine. What I learned was, uh, given a choice, and, and unfortunately you don't have to, have to make the choice, but given the choice of having dedicated people with courage and resilience fighting on your side who may not have the same level of equipment, uh, you would choose that any time over demoralized folks uh, who are taking Russian equipment into the battle and running away from it or seeing themselves overwhelmed. My bottom line is this. Uh, President Biden has led uh, the NATO alliance and the European Union uh, in a most amazing effort. The Ukrainian people continue to just amaze us uh, with their courage. Uh, and I believe that the Ukrainians are going to prevail and the United States is going to stand by their side. Hmm. How much faith, this delegation from the Ukrainian parliament, how much faith were they putting in the negotiations that have been going on between the Russians and Ukrainians? They didn't dwell on that. Uh, they understand it's important that we pursue diplomacy to try to end the bloodshed that Vladimir Putin has imposed. Uh, but they were dwelling on the resistance uh, and the lives of so many people that they know uh, and love uh, that are at risk every single day because of Putin's uh, ter terrible, reckless conduct uh, in Ukraine. They want more equipment, and I certainly understand that. And the military uses uh, of weapons and ammunition uh, have to be matched the uh, challenge that they face from the Russians. Is there any equipment you don't think they should have? Oh, no. Now, let me tell you at this point, that's a, a, an important calculation. We want Ukraine to prevail and to reclaim their home. We do not want World War III. We certainly don't want something worse than that. So it's a delicate balance, keeping the alliance together, supporting Ukraine, going far enough so that Ukraine can prevail, but not so far as a, uh, Vladimir Putin might take to an extreme. Uh, the president has to make that decision every day with our allies in NATO. It is not a, an easy task. So the West has called Vladimir Putin a war criminal, so is the president. Uh, yet the former president of the United States talking about the investigation, the federal investigation into Hunter Biden, which is real. The former president of the United States, Donald Trump, basically asked on television for Vladimir Putin to provide information on Hunter Biden. Your reaction to that? Donald Trump continues to be so out of touch with reality. He is focused on his big lie about how he, how he actually won the election and he can't think of anything else. We have innocent people in Ukraine dying every day and he's worried about his own political status. Virtually the world has vilified Putin for what he's done in, in right. Ukraine. And this former president, Donald Trump, thinks about how he might reestablish this relationship with Putin to help him personally. He is so egocentric and so selfish, he cannot see that there is a much larger issue here. Uh, the issue, of course, is Putin is a war criminal. What he's doing to innocent people should be treated as such. And the notion that Donald Trump is going to game him some way or another to help him personally is just disgusting. So you are the chair of the Judiciary Committee. Yesterday, Susan Collins, a Republican from Maine, came out and said she would come out to support the, the nomination of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson to the Supreme Court. Um, do you have any other Republicans at this point who you say will vote yes? I'm working on it. It's an interesting assignment as a whip, uh, working both Democrats and Republicans. I think our Democrats are in good shape. On the Republican side, you don't twist arms around here. You sit down and talk to people on the floor. 
and I had a chance to do that yesterday with a number of Republican senators. Uh, I'm hoping that they will join to make this an even larger group of bipartisan support for this great judge. But no promises yet beyond Susan Collins. No, not at this point, but I'm not giving up. We're going to use every minute to make sure we build this majority. Senator Dick Durbin, Chairman, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, too. All right, the breaking news this morning that Vladimir Putin has authorized more than 134,000 people to be drafted into the Russian armed forces. What that means for the next phase of the invasion.